And words to that effect So is Good evening. I call to order the regular city council meeting of April 11th in the city of Lakewood. Will the clerk please call the roll? Paul? Here. Wickman? Here. Vincent? Here. Royball? Here. Harrison? Here. Johnson? Here. Shakti? Here. Abel? Here. Coop? Here. Franks? Here. Gutwine? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Well, I'd like to welcome those in chambers and those who may be tuning in online or might check us out here in a couple days. Uh, it's a beautiful evening, so thanks for taking the time out to come here and hang out with us. I ask if you do have a cell phone, please put it on silence, and uh, we will rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Stay standing for a moment of silent prayer. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Item four. Item four, proclamation, Child Abuse Prevention Month. Yes, as well. And Mayor Pro, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson is going to read for us tonight. Yes, please. Recognizing April as Child Abuse Prevention Month, whereas Every child deserves to grow up in a nurturing environment, free from harm and fear. But too many children are victims of abuse. And whereas child abuse and neglect is a serious problem affecting every segment of our community. And child abuse can have psychological, emotional, and physical effects that can have lifelong consequences for victims. And whereas it is up to us as a community to tirelessly work to end abuse through awareness and action, because one abused child is one too many. And whereas the month of April has been designated nationally as Child Abuse Prevention Month, and we urge all Lakewood residents to commit to preventing and reporting child abuse and to learning what to do to protect a child's safety and well-being. And whereas Lakewood has dedicated individuals and organizations, such as the Ralston House, who work daily to counter child abuse and to help parents obtain the assistance they need, and whereas effective services such as the Ralston House succeed because of partnerships among families, social service agencies, schools, religious and civic organizations, law enforcement, agencies and the business community and whereas all residents community agencies faith organizations and businesses must commit to increasing their efforts to support families and prevent child abuse now 
Therefore, on behalf of City Council and the people of Lakewood, Colorado, I, Adam Paul, Mayor of the City of Lakewood, Colorado, by virtue of the authority vested in me, do hereby recognize April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. And you know, it's not just a month long effort. This is a year long 12 month effort. And it's unfortunate that we have to take the time to read something like this or to recognize this, but it is something that is real in our communities. And these folks right here probably want to talk a little bit about some great programs uh, that we have in the community to help tackle this. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, City Council members. I'm Dan McCaskey, Division Chief of the Lakewood Police Department, and I'd like to introduce some special guests tonight. Tara Rosner is our uh, uh, de Development Director from Ralston House, and I think we all know uh, Sue King, former City Council member, and she's also a board member on Ralston House, and uh, we're honored to have them here tonight. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, City Manager Kathy Hodson, who's also a board member, and Councillor Harrison is one of our former board members, so there's quite a few of us in, in the building tonight. So, uh, But thank you for your continued support, and uh, I know for some of the new council members, uh, you'll probably see me up here a few times during the year for Ralston House, but uh, it's really an important part of our community. Last year, we served over 1,100 children that were either victims of physical or sexual abuse or witnessed violent crimes. And that number continues to rise every year. So this is really an important, uh, an important function that, that Ralston House serves, helping these children. Our uh, mission statement is, is uh, you know, stop, stop the abuse, start the healing. And that's what we try to do. And we, can't, we couldn't do that without your support. And uh, so we, it, we're honored to have that. And so thank you very much. And, and Mayor, thank you for the proclamation as well. Um, before I finish, I just want to add one thing. Uh, mark your calendars for August 27th, and I'll be back before that, obviously, to talk to you about our .5K. We partnered with Belmar again, and so we're going to have our race over uh, in, in, the, in the Belmar area. It's .5K. It's not a 5K, so it's not too strenuous, but it's a great cause, and it's a lot of fun, and it really brings the community together. Last year, we had almost 500 people. So we're reaching the numbers that Arvada has, and uh, every year I challenge Lakewood to uh, let's show up Arvada and show them who the best city in the metro area is. So, uh, but thank you for your support; it is really appreciated, Mayor. Thank you. And he failed to mention that we race that point five k. Dan and I do. I would love to talk about these. All of us have one of these sitting up here. And these you will see all over the city of Lakewood um, in gardens and whatnot. And, and you can have one for your own home um, or put it at your business. For $5, um, you can own a pinwheel that goes to help support these children in what they have to face. This is one of the fundraisers that Ralston Board has. So um, look be sure at the businesses that you support, tell them thank you because they've put a garden up and have supported this. And any of us on council can get you in connection with more pinwheels. And they hold up beautifully. They'll even go out of your car window. Oh, I didn't say that, Chief. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Councilor Harrison. Item five, please. Item five, Proclamation Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. Right, and Ms. Debbie Jones will be coming down to join me. Welcome. It's nice to see you. And Mayor Pro Tem Johnson will be reading for us. Thank you, Mayor. Recognizing April as Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. Whereas Parkinson's disease is a chronic, progressive, neurological disease and is the second most common neurological degenerative disease in the United States. And whereas it is estimated that the disease affects up to one and a half million people in this country, and its occurrence is projected to more than double 
by 2040. And whereas it is estimated that the economic burden of Parkinson's disease is at least 14 billion annually, including indirect costs to patients and family members of 6 billion. And whereas research suggests the cause of Parkinson's disease is a combination of genetic and environmental factors, but the exact cause and progression of the disease is still unknown. And whereas the symptoms of Parkinson's disease vary from person to person and can include tremors, slowness of movement and rigidity, difficulty with balance, swallowing and chewing and speaking, cognitive impairment and dementia, mood disorders, and sleep difficulties, and whereas local, regional, and state volunteers, researchers, and medical professionals are working to improve the quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease and their families, and whereas increased education and research is needed to find more effective treatments with fewer side effects and ultimately a cure for the disease. Now, therefore, on behalf of the City Council and the people of the City of Lakewood, I, Adam Paul, Mayor of the City of Lakewood, Colorado, by virtue of the authority vested in me, do hereby recognize April as Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Ms. Jones. And again, this is uh, another one of those that's unfortunate, but it's, this is real, and I think we've all been touched. I personally have been touched. My grandmother uh, had Parkinson's and eventually succumbed to that. So, Ms. Jones, uh, I think you reached out to us last year yes, for the I first did. time and, and suggested that we do this, and so we're back our second year to try to raise awareness, and I thank you for bringing this to our attention and thank being you. a champion. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, council members, thank you for the proclamation. Um, I did give a pamphlet uh, to the city clerk, thank you, to pass around so that those of you who are not familiar with Parkinson's disease can have some information about it. Um, I would like to say that while there is no cure for Parkinson's disease, one of the things that we have found as a magic bullet has been exercise to slow the progression of the disease. And for that, I honestly want to thank the city of Lakewood for their recreation centers. We use them on average of five times a week, and that really has slowed the progression of my husband's disease. Um, the one thing I would ask that the council and, and that the city manager consider is looking at Parkinson's specific exercise classes at these rec centers. Right now for us t to attend any kind of specific Parkinson's disease exercise class, we have to go to Aurora, we have to go to Westminster, we have to go way south. So I'm just asking you to please consider that when you're looking at your planning for the classes. <clears throat> I also would like to say that we also have an event June 5th, it's the Vitality Walk, and it's where the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies sponsors a walk for members of the community who are dealing with Parkinson's and their family members. And I would challenge the city to maybe put together a team and join us at the walk. All right. Thank well, you, Mayor. Thank you very much. And, and I can say I saw out of the corner of my eye when you made that recommendation, I saw our city manager writing that down, so thank you. All right, we are to public comment. And uh, this is the time of the evening when you are uh, welcome to come and address the council on any item that is not on the agenda. And uh, you're allowed three minutes, and you have a little light up there that will go green. When you have 30 seconds left, yellow. And when you are done, it'll go red, and I'll try to cut you off as well, polit politely. 
And uh, we just ask that you keep your, keep your uh, words focused on the, the subject. And again, you're welcome to join us. Randy Earnhardt is our first, 337 Wright Street. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. Uh, my subject tonight is sidewalks. Sidewalks are expensive. I just did a Google search before coming in, and average cost per mile can be over $1 million. Excuse me, sir. Could, yes. I, could I ask you to speak directly into the microphones? Okay. For the audio recording. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And, uh, but there are benefits, and uh, not only exercise, of course. And I went on my... Um, walking journeys, but uh, a walkable city such as Denver is known to be can command office rents 10 to 15 percent higher. I would like to uh, give big kudos to Lakewood for the big project on Wadsworth from Colfax to Alameda. I feel when this project is com completed, uh, this will be a very beautiful area to walk and um, I'm sure once the six in Wadsworth is also completed, it will be much safer for pedestrians as well. Uh, important corridors I see for Lakewood are Alameda, Colfax, and Jewel on a smaller scale. Now I know uh, Lakewood is not like uh, other cities like Denver with bars and restaurants and apartments seemingly to pop up on everywhere, but we're right next to a city that does have this. So my question for the city council and the mayor is, there a comprehensive plan for sidewalks on uh, Colfax from, let's say, uh, Sheridan to Depew in this area um, on the south side of Colfax? There's not really a sidewalk, but just an area maybe 30 inches, maybe 36 inches wide. And uh, I've been in contact with a city worker, and he's trying to address an issue where a retaining wall from a car dealership is crumbling into the sidewalk area and he's uh, doing great strides on getting that fixed but that's just one small area he's working on and that's all i have okay thank you we'll we'll get through public comment and i'll come back okay thank you yeah thank you for coming out appreciate that and you are the only one who's signed up but i will uh open it to anybody else if anybody else would like to speak with that i will close public comment Yes, uh, walkable city is a livable city and vice versa. It's definitely been a priority of this council for the last few years to really start to increase funding in certain areas. Uh, Colfax is interesting. You do have some areas where new development will pave the way, but it's something that we are always looking at. We will take a look at the Depew and Colfax piece and, and see. For some reason, I think that there is a new project in that area on the south side that might enhance that you know i don't want to misspeak here so i'll double check that with staff okay. and get back with you yeah. but but definitely in come budget time you know please feel free to come back and that'll be a discussion amongst council council as well as where to strategically place these sidewalks you know some neighborhoods don't want sidewalks some do want more connections so we've always tried to find that balance so council member shakti just that that we have I, I completely agree both with it, sidewalks being um, essential and very expensive and in the last few years we've been putting extra money every year and one year we put even an additional amount of money towards sidewalks um, and we have a, a ranking system um, that that staff does to prioritize those places where it gets the most use and there you know all of the logical things you can imagine so that um, we really get the sidewalks where they're needed so they'll get you the specifics but there's the so thank you all right moving on to the consent agenda the use of the consent agenda has been made to expedite council action it contains both resolutions and first reading ordinances Resolutions are items of routine nature. Members of the public will have an opportunity in a moment to comment on any of the proposed resolutions. First reading ordinances appear on the agenda only for the purpose of setting future public hearing dates and ordering the newspaper publication of the proposed ordinance. 
No public comment will be heard this evening on first reading ordinances. The public will have the opportunity to comment on the proposed ordinances during the scheduled public hearings on the dates set tonight by the city council. Uh, will the city clerk please read the items on the consent agenda into the record? The consent agenda consists of items 7 through 13 inclusive. Item 7, Resolution 2016-18, authorizing a revocable license agreement to allow placement and maintenance of pedestrian scale lighting fixtures in the Oak Street and Nelson Street rights of way. Item 8, Resolution 2016-19, endorsing the projects and project funding levels in the 2016 Annual Action Plan for the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG program. Item 9, Resolution 2016-20, approving an intergovernmental agreement establishing the Jefferson County Communications Center, JEFCOM. Item 10, Resolution 2016-21, establishing projects and project funding levels for the 2016 Capital Improvement and Preservation Program, CIPP, Neighborhood Participation Program. Item 11, Resolution 2016-22, approving the first amendment to the service plan for Denver West Promenade Metropolitan District. Item 12, Ordinance 02016-3, authorizing certain technology purchases and approving a supplemental appropriation for the 2016 fiscal year from the Equipment Replacement Fund. And item 13, Ordinance 02016-4, to rezone land located at 5501 West 10th Avenue, 5555 West 10th Avenue, 5565 West 10th Avenue, 5601 West 10th Avenue, 5665 West 10th Avenue, and 5540 West 11th Avenue, Lakewood, Colorado, zip 80214, County of Jefferson, State of Colorado. Thank you, Ms. Greer, and I would like to pull item 11 and place it under general business, please. Anything else? I'd like to remove item uh, uh, 9 from the uh, consent agenda for discussion. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. I agree. Okay. All right. This time I'll open the public comment period on the proposed resolutions contained in the consent agenda minus items 9 and 11. Nobody has signed up to speak. Anybody wish to speak on those resolutions? With that, public comment is closed. And I will entertain a motion, please. Mayor Paul, I order all ordinances introduced on first reading to be published in the Denver Post with public hearings set for the date included in the ordinance and move for adoption of resolutions. Eight, uh, seven, no. Seven, eight, Item ten. Well, those are item numbers, and uh, all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into, into the record by the city clerk. Did that work? We missed, we missed some. We missed 12 and 13. Yeah, it, it would be oh. best if we could use the resolution numbers. She did 12 and 13 at first. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think you could say, um, as read into the record by the city clerk, with the exceptions of items 9 and 11. Mayor Paul, I order all ordinances introduced on first reading to be published in the Denver Post with public hearing set for the date included in the ordinance and move for adoption of resolutions all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced in the record by the city clerk with the exception of um, item 9, resolution 2016-20, and item 11, resolution 2016-22. I second. Perfect. A motion and a second. Discussion amongst council. No discussion. Seeing none, let's get to that screen.
please cast your votes. And that passes. Unanimous, 11 ayes, zero nays. That was easy. All right, so we'll go into general business and will the clerk please read item nine back into the record. Item nine, resolution 2016-20, approving an intergovernmental agreement establishing the Jefferson County Communications Center, Jeffcom. All right. And uh, I had previously opened a public comment on this and there was none, so we'll go to council member comments and questions. Council member Franks. Well, I figure since we opened it up for this discussion, I know that last time we talked about how in the first couple of years uh, that there may not be any actual savings, but I wanted to find out if there was any kind of dollar projections for maybe years three out. And I just didn't know whether we had that or not since we opened this back up. Good evening, Chief Paletta. Good evening, Mayor Paul, members of City Council. Uh, you will recall last week we had the uh, presentation by Brian Wilkerson with Revolution Advisors that projected roughly a 16% budget savings um, beginning, we hope to begin the first year, but certainly beginning years two and beyond. If you apply that percentage to our current budget in the communications center, it's roughly a $500,000 savings per year. Council Member Abel. Thank you. Uh, this may be more for uh, the city manager, but uh, are we going to use a baseline to track these savings so we'll know what they are year to year? Currently, we budget a communication center that uh, has line items for both personnel costs, equipment costs, service costs, etc. Um, comparing budgets from what we have right now moving forward is actually quite easy to do because in the future we will, we will be making quarterly payments to the Jeffcom Center. So taking a look at what we pay right now will be very easy to compare what we pay in the future. And this is definitely for the manager. I would hope that the, uh, a, a comment, I would hope that the savings we make or that we realize uh, stays with our public safety department instead of uh, being spread out through the general fund. Thank you for that comment. I appreciate it. And that is our intention. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I... <laughs> I think this is a great idea, number one, but there's a few things I'd like to see us at least entertain to change some language on. The first one is, is that this does have a look back of a five-year program or five years. I'd like to see us change that to three years. It's a brand new program. I think it would be helpful for the next council to, to hear exactly what's going on a little sooner than five years, number one. Number two, on page 20, um, you're talking about an annual audit and it's to be done by a certified CPA, but we don't say how that CPA will be um, designated, how we'll choose one. I think it'd be helpful to have some language to say how we're gonna go about that, if it's gonna be put out for a bid process. And then the third thing on page 21, we've got where two citizens will be part of the board, the supervisory board, or, um, but we don't again say how those citizens are going to be determined, who's going to pick them, what criteria we're gonna use, who's gonna do that. I'd like to see some clearer language in there. I think it'd be helpful to have people there that are outside of the system and bring a different outside perspective but we at least need to know how they're going to be picked and who's going to pick them and their criteria. Okay, we okay. will. The plan is uh, currently right now, as we mentioned last week, all of the uh, chiefs are going forward to their elected boards to present their IGAs. Uh, they are receiving comments from their elected officials, very similar to the comments that we are receiving tonight. Those will be gathered collectively, brought back to the board and, and I'm sure we're gonna see some amendments to this. Does that mean that we do not put the language in tonight, but that it goes back to the entire board and then, the, so we, when it comes back, 
then we'll see what the changes are from everybody collectively. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. Councilmember Harrison. Um, one thing that, that as I was looking over the proposal, the one thing that I would love to see is um, you had a $500,000, uh, let's see, what did we call it? Capital appreciation? Capital improvement fund. Improvement yes. fund, thank you. Um, and one of the things that I would love to see is a, an, some sort of an interest uh, factor that would be included in there because 500,000 today won't go very far five years from now or whenever we need it in the future. So I would like to see that um, increased appropriately. Technology is not a cheap thing, and we need to budget for it appropriately. So I think that's an important thing to do. So thank, thank you. you for that comment. We certainly recognize, and I think the language in the IGA is that that is to be a minimum amount, but certainly we would desire to have more. Right, any other questions or comments? All right, well, we had a presentation on this last week, I think very thorough, and uh, you had uh, all the brass out for that, so we appreciate that. And uh, for those folks who may just be tuning in today, you can go into the archives and see the full presentation. A lot of great information and a really great program to, to bring better service, better efficiencies, and hopefully better respond times to, to all of our communities within Jefferson County. So again, hats off to our chief and, and all the jurisdictions who are participating. This is uh, really important and it says a lot about how well we work together with our other jurisdictions. So with that, please cast your votes. Maybe. Councilmember Franks. All right, and that carries 11 I, zero nay. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think we might have. Did we jump the gun without a motion, motion in a, in a second? second. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got 11, <laughs> but now we get to clear it. Something must be in this water tonight, I don't know. Councilor Abel, did you want to speak before we were you just pointing I, that I out? I just want to have, um, get a clarification. We're approving a resolution tonight that may be amended after it's processed by other councils and uh, commissions, I guess. How does it come back to us if we approve it tonight and when? Uh, once we've had a general discussion about all of the amendments that are being proposed by the various elected boards, the board will come back forward with those uh, proposed amendments contained in one package. Uh, there are at least, well, I know the Arvada City Council has some suggestions for this, as well as the Evergreen Fire Protection District have some suggestions. Uh, the board is, uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of the other seven agencies, the, the board is going to have to discuss each recommendation individually and decide if they approve those and want to see it added to the IGA before it becomes comes back before the elected bodies. Okay, so we can expect to see a resolution with those changes brought back to us to override this resolution or replace this resolution. I, I think, Councillor, the, um, the process with all these jurisdictions involved there's been a lot of back and forth many drafts uh, have changed hands so there's general agreement among the staffs uh, of those uh, cities and towns and um, regarding the content so each jurisdiction is being asked to approve that IGA that agreement through a resolution and once everyone has done that it will be approved and in place uh, then there's this process for uh, evaluating amendments as proposed by the various parties. So you'll have an approved, as I understand, you'll have an approved IGA, and then there'll be at some point after it's taken effect that the board will suggest some changes to all of the jurisdictions. But it has to be the oh. same agreement appro approved by everybody. Uh, so it'll come back when those changes are proposed. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go back in time, and I'm going to entertain a motion. I move for the adoption of Resolution 2016-20. Second. All right. Motion and a second. Please cast your votes. There's, and it really passes this time. <laughs> 11 ayes, zero nays. Congratulations, Chief. Thank you. 
Okay, will the clerk please read item 11 back into the record? Item 11, Resolution 2016-22, approving the First Amendment to the Service Plan for Denver West Promenade Metropolitan District. Okay. Um, we have a presentation, so I'm going to welcome down Robert Rogers of uh, White Bear, Ankiel, Tanaka, and Waldron. Welcome. But, uh, Mr. Uh, Abel, did you? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but... Um the public comment period that was opened up on the resolutions was done after these two items were removed. So I think it would be appropriate to first ask if anybody is looking to comment on this resolution. All right. I'll open public comment. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Did you guys? Oh. We do have it. Okay. Welcome. Make my point. Please make your comments. Welcome. Tell us your name, if you wouldn't mind. Lakshmi Mbrek. I'm a property owner in the Denver West Promenade Development, and I would like to formally object to the proposal. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the 2015 tax assessments received by the owners of the development, uh, the first reflecting the recent improvement of the property, have created tremendous concern. Our leases are all triple N's, so the property tax expense is passed through to the tenants. The property tax is currently being assessed already at an unreasonable high burden to the businesses occupying the center, all of which sign the leases based on a much lower tax estimate. There is a high likelihood that many of the business will not survive the recent increase and will be forced to leave the center. I have four tenants in the shop at, and two of them have already indicated that they plan to leave based upon the recent tax increases, and this will impose even higher tax increases to the, to the center. The resulting vacancies will put downward pressure on the lease rates. With lower lease rates, property values will drop, and the taxing bodies will then need to lower the tax assessment to reflect the new financial realities of the center. In the meantime, business will have failed. People will have lost their jobs. These are the predictable consequences of the recent exorbitant increase to the center. To consider an additional tax mill levy to support a higher debt ceiling for the district will clearly exacerbate the situation, thus adding fuel to the fire. It is hard for me to imagine it would be in the best interest of Lakewood to promote the clearly destructive economic cycle. I would urge you to consider the big picture consequences and reject this requested debt ceiling increase for the benefit of the community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. If you want to leave the letter with our city clerk, she'll make sure that we have copies. Anybody else wish to speak in chambers? All right, with that, I'll close public comment and uh, go to the presentation. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for your time. My name is Robert Rogers. I'm with the law firm of White Bear, Ankley, Tanaka, and Waldron. Uh, we represent the Metropolitan District, and I believe that a few of you may be uh, new to the Council since the district was first approved, so I thought it would be appropriate to, uh, to take a couple steps backward to just give you some, some context on the history of the district. Um, the, uh, the district was first approved. The service plan was approved in 2012. It's an 11.72-acre commercial project. Uh, the the in service plan that was approved in 2012 authorized a, a debt total debt limitation of $5 million and a maximum mill levy of 50 mills until any portion of any debt is equal to or lower than 50% of the assessed value within the boundaries of the district, at, at which time that mill levy rate becomes unlimited. The uh, operations uh, that are funded through the mill levy uh, is, is also unlimited within the district or it, the initial service plan uh, approved an unlimited mill levy rate. The current mill levy rate within the district is uh, for, for O&M is 10 mills. The financing plan uh, at 2012, in 2012 when the service plan was adopted anticipated the issuance of $4.8 million in bonds uh, to, to be supported by a mill levy of 50 mills and I think that's a, a critical number and we'll come back to that in, in just a minute. 
since the date of the original uh, service plan approval, bonds were issued by the district in 2013 to reimburse for public improvements that were constructed on, on the district's behalf. And those improvements obviously are, are intended to benefit the district and to increase the assessed valuation within the district. Uh, those, those bonds were issued in the amount of uh, $3,630,000 and they had a 30 year maturity date. And those bonds uh, are secured by a pledge of 50 mills within the district. Um, there's, there's also 10 mills being imposed currently for operations and maintenance. The service plan amendment that is being proposed tonight would add an additional $1 million in, in total debt authorization so that it would amend the current debt authorization from $5 million to $6 million, but it would do nothing to amend the uh, 50 mil rate that was approved in the 2012 service plan and is currently being imposed to pay off the first set of bonds that were issued in 2013. So I, I think that's a, a pretty critical fact, and I'll, I'll come back to that again at, at the end of the presentation. Uh, the, there, there have been a few letters of opposi opposition, and, and I'll also address those again, at, or address those at the, the end of the presentation. Uh, the, the purpose of the, of the next bond issuance that the district would like to move forward with and, and needs the service plan amendment to move forward with is to utilize proceeds to finalize reimbursements associated with costs of public improvements that have been funded on behalf of the district and uh, benefit the, the property within the district and increase values uh, that make that property more valuable. They, they uh, are, are there to support commercial activity uh, within that, that district, which is, of course, a benefit to the property owners and to the tenants in, on that property. Uh, the, the city has received some objections, and uh, m most of them are, are to the... Uh, their, their objections that assume that the rate of tax and, and the, the total tax liability associated with the properties in, in the district are going to increase. And respectfully, but, but vehemently, we disagree with that assertion. We, again, the, we are not requesting an increase in the rate that the district is allowed to impose. The district is currently allowed to and is imposing a 50 mil mm. debt service mill levy rate. And as, as the district moves forward with the restructuring of its debt and the reimbursement for the improvements that have been constructed, the financial forecast that's attached to the amended, uh, to the service plan amendment that you're looking at projects a, a decrease in the overall mill levy rate out there uh, starting in 2017 from 50 mills down to 45 mills. So rather than increasing the tax liability associated with the properties and within that district, uh, this service plan amendment is, is part of a bigger effort to restructure the debt out there with the intent of dropping that overall mill levy rate and the tax liability associated with that property. Um, there, there's a copy of the proposed amendment and, and the resolution in, in your packet, and I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding that amendment and, and that financial plan. Um, the, so, so one more time, I just want to be very clear, the impact of, to property owners regarding the total amount of annual property taxes uh, is, is anticipated to be zero this first year, and then it's supposed to, I mean, the, the plan of doing all this is to try to drop the mill levy rate in, in years going forward as, as this debt is retired. Uh, a, a couple other points that I think are critical. Uh, the first is that, that the debt is only imposed within the boundaries of this metro district. So that we're talking about an 11.7 acre uh, piece of property. There is no debt uh, that, that the city has any responsibility for. The city doesn't back any of the debt uh, issued by the metro district. And the metro district is a governmental entity uh, like a municipality. I, th I think a good analogy is that uh, a municipality is, is an autonomous body that uh, operates within the bounds uh, that are set by the legislature and by the home rule charter of the municipality and, and a district is, a, is an independent governmental entity that operates within the, the boundaries that are established by the municipality that authorizes it. So just a, just a, a reminder there for uh, those who may not have had as much exposure to metro districts. Uh, and another point that I think is important to make is that it's an elected board of uh, directors and they're, they're was an election opportunity within the last few months here in the in the metro district, and there weren't any uh, there weren't any potential board members that uh, put their name in the hat for the election. So, just like with a municipality, there is a political process uh, by which interested property owners can uh, 
can get elected to the board and then can participate in the in the uh, operations and the financial decisions of the district. Uh, so with that, I, I should probably stop and uh, ask if there are any questions. I know there's a lot of information being put yes. in front of you. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rogers. There are going to be some questions, and I'm just going to ask for a motion in a second so we can read this into the record prior to prior to the questions. I move for the adoption of resolution 2016-22. Second. Right, motion is second, so now we'll have discussion. Uh, Councillor Franks. Well, my first comment is that since Exhibit E was missing and didn't come to us until today, did not have sufficient time to look over the materials, so I may be asking some questions that are within your uh, the documents. Um, what specifically was the work done that is raising, is the impetus for the need to ask for an additional million dollars in the cap? Well, w one thing I should, so, the answer to that is uh, unfortunately one that takes a minute to, uh, to fully unpack, but there, there are water, sewer, uh, street improvements out there, and, and they far exceeded the amount of uh, debt authorization that's currently being uh, requested. The, the way that we came to the, to the six million figure, well, initially the way that we came to the five million figure is because that, that based on the assumptions that uh, the financial gurus out there that model all, the, all, of, all of that put together, uh, it, it appeared at the time that $5 million was all that the district was going to be able to reasonably retire over a 30-year period. And since that occurred, so it, at the time, the, the developer that uh, initiated that project and, and went out and uh, took out all the debt to fund those improvements uh, made a business decision with, with uh, the forecasting models that were available. Uh, that, that five million was the approval that they would seek from the city council, and, and of course that was given. Uh, since then, the assessed valuations have increased substantially out there, and it's created some additional capacity. So while, while six million is being requested, uh, the amount of, of total public improvements out there that would be eligible, assuming a higher assessed valuation, far exceeds six million. I, I don't recall offhand exactly what the number is, but I think it was somewhere in the 12, 13 million dollar range. So the, the simple answer to your question is that uh, there were water, there was water, uh, sewer, street infrastructure, uh, common area infrastructure, mall infrastructure uh, that, that all qualifies. And there's about 12 or 12 million dollars, somewhere in that range of it. And, and six million dollars is what we are seeking uh, the ability to reimburse for. Um, help me understand the process of how you have a debt, you know, a ceiling that you have, and then you see that it's going to be an overrun. As a, as a project manager, I'm not allowed to, I have to do my projections and estimate to complete, estimate at complete, and request funds before I get to the point of overspending. It sounds to me, if I've read the paperwork correctly, the money, the, the improvements are done and the money's owed. So I want to understand the process and then what happens if we say no. So the, the district enters into an agreement with the developer that advances all the costs of the improvements, and the district agrees to reimburse the developer uh, with as much capacity as, as the district can, can obtain. And so any delta between what the council is willing to approve and, and what the developer is out of pocket for uh, is just eaten by the developer. No more questions. Council Member Abel? Pardon me. Uh, you have spent uh, five million. You have six million dollars worth of improvements, and now you're asking for the other million dollars. Is that kind of the nutshell answer to Ms. Frank's answer uh, question? Uh, yes, sir, Councillor. I, I think just a slightly more accurate, uh, very brief summary is that there's about thirteen million dollars of improved twelve twelve million dollars of improvements. Uh, there's about six million of, of capacity, uh, and there's about five million that is currently authorized to be reimbursed, and so the district is seeking one million more in authorization. But the hard cost is six million. The estimated value of those improvements is thirteen. Is the that hard, what you're saying? The hard cost is is thirteen 
or 12, I, again, I don't remember exactly where it is, but, okay. but that, that delta uh, is, is something that the, the developer recognizes can't be feasibly uh, reimbursed based on the mill levy cap that's in place out there, the 50 mill levy cap. So if, if for example, there are jurisdictions where districts have 60, 70, 80, 80 mill caps, uh, and in those jurisdictions it would be feasible to reimburse for more of these hard costs, but uh, operating within the current constraints of the service plan, six million is, is all that could be feasibly reimbursed. I've been exposed to a number of uh, mill levies for special districts in uh, the Jeffco area, and I don't recall very many that have a 50 mill cap. That's quite high. Uh, you were discussing the uh, operations and such. Is it... I seem to recall there is a debt succession that as more people buy property in a special district, the leadership of the district shifts toward the new voters in the district, those people who have bought property. And eventually, the developers fade out of the picture and the district is turned over to the property owners that have bought up the built-out area. Is that correct? Correct. So eventually you folks will be leaving and the property owners will be assuming the operation of the district and the retirement of the debt. Is that correct? Well, the developer out there is all that that transition has already started to occur. So there are, there are two developers uh, representatives that sit on the board currently. Uh, there's there's been an opportunity for uh, for a, a complete turnover, and it just hasn't happened yet. There hasn't been the interest out there, uh, but there but there are currently only two two out of the five seats are are taken up by the developer. But eventually, those seats will go to folks elected by the property owners if things work the way they're supposed to work in the special district world. Sure. Okay. So you folks will be out of the picture having spent the money. And you will have sold the properties, so hopefully you will walk away with some reward for that. But the folks who own the property will be those people who are responsible for retiring the remainder of the debt. Uh, the, the only part of that uh, that, that I is just doesn't quite quite fit this fact scenario is that I, I don't work for the developer I work for the district so I I will hopefully continue working for the district, as you, long as the district. you will be there but that will be up to whom, whomever the new pro the property owners elect for the board of directors that's right but still you will be there the developers will be gone and the debt will belong to the property owners uh, the the debt will belong to the district and uh, right. the the tax burden to pay off that debt is paid paid by the property owners. That's right. Thank you. Uh, back in the 80s, we had some severe problems with special districts and uh, the debt left to the folks who owned the property. And uh, a lot of them went belly up. Folks lost their homes, uh, their savings. Uh, but I, I, I believe the new uh, state uh, requirements make that less likely. However, one of the things that this uh, proposal centers around was Exhibit E, a very important uh, financial component to this, this plan, and it was not in our packet. Uh, it was made available to Council only this morning, uh, along with two other financial documents, uh, probably four or five dozen pages worth of financial uh, information. And it is gives the council a short window with which to uh, examine this information. And I don't believe that uh, the gentleman, the property owner that spoke to us, has ever even had a chance to review these documents. And that no one else in the community uh, who might have looked at our council packet for this information has seen it either. Uh, I know there's a motion on the table, but I would like to offer an amendment that this be continued uh, 
for at least a couple of weeks to give counsel and the community an opportunity to study this uh, very important information that came in at the 11th hour. Mr. Uh, Councilor Abel, could I ask you to withdraw that just for a moment and get through a couple more questions? Please. Certainly. Thank you. All right. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you. Um, in reading through this today, I'm kind of gotten in the weeds and my eyes were getting a little glazed over to be honest with you happens to me all the time yeah well me too um, just help me understand it in simple language for myself improvements were made spending money that you didn't have authorization to spend is that really th that's the bottom line right no it's not so the the developer uh, fronted money for improvements and entered into an agreement with the district and the district said we will reimburse for as much authorization as we can get assuming that when th there's a process whereby the developer certifies the costs you use an independent engineer and an independent accountant and you go through this certification process and at the end of it the district uh, through its agreement with the developer commits to reimburse for the, de the developer uh, up to the limits that are imposed in the service plan. So when the district entered into the agreement with the developer uh, at the time there was a five million dollar cap on what could be reimbursed. Correct and six million dollars worth of improvements were made. Correct? Uh, tw Twelve million were constructed by the developer, but the district is not on the hook. The district's not on the hook for the difference between the five million and the six million currently. The district's not on the hook for the difference between the five million and the 12 million, uh, but the district recognizes that the developer spent $12 million of, of money that it achieved through a construction loan on public improvements, the same type of improvements that the municipality builds. Uh, and the district is seeking authorization to reimburse for an additional million, uh, bringing the total to six out of the, again, I, I don't remember if it's right at 12, but it's in the neighborhood of 12 total. Okay, but everybody thought it was going to be five million and it ended up to be six. It, at the time, uh, the financial projections using some, you always want to use conservative numbers, but the financial projections showed at the time that five million looked feasible. Now that now that a larger percentage of that total looks feasible, that's that's why the district is requesting authorization to reimburse for the additional million. And so improvements were made without having authorization for the additional one million, correct? Uh, yes, but the district didn't isn't financially on the hook for those improvements at this point. The developer will be. The developer has been. Okay. What is, is there any um, guarantees that this isn't going to happen again? And is there, are there more improvements needed? And people will be coming back again and saying, we've spent more money and we need more money. They're, the project's fully built out, so there are no more. Uh, you no don't anticipate that. Okay. Um, couple things here. Um, for me, process is extremely important. I think it's what shows the foundation of our, of our democracy and keeps us ethical and honest. I'm concerned about the process on this. This was first shown on our agenda on August the 11th. Uh, excuse me. It was not shown until about a week ago. I don't think it had been scheduled. Margie, please tell me when this first showed up. I don't have that information. I'm sorry. Okay, I just looked it up, and I think it wasn't until about at least a week ago when it was first on our agenda. You know, this is kind of a big deal, really. And I, I've struggled with this for quite a while, that on Fridays, 
we get a considerable amount of information, a large packet. And then, um, in this case, and I don't think there was any anything that was done intentionally, but we did not have all the financials. And when I started going through th those numbers, I would like to see our council have a better explanation of what these pages and pages of numbers really mean. Um, as I say, process to me is important. And I'm having a hard time that we just got this information a few days ago and, and need to, to, to deal with it. Um, you mentioned the election of the board. And was, was there any indication that this kind of a consideration was going to come forward um, later on after that election? I mean, you said nobody came forward to try and run, you know, to, to be on the board or to be in opposition. Did anybody understand that after the election, there was going to be something like this put on for consideration? Was that made public ahead of time before the board election? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, it was not one, but there, there are a couple of points. First, I, I agree with your point 100% that process is very important, and I agree with uh, Councilmember Abel's point. And is the is the attorney for for a couple of a couple of different municipalities? I I have have sat there with councils and understand. The, the process of needing to go through a very very thick packet uh, in a very short period of time and and I, I know that there are uh, very important decisions in front of of the council at every meeting and what, one thing I should just note here before we go back to uh, to council member Abel's uh, motion is that th there is no problem at ever uh, no problem at all on on our part with with a continuation and, and providing a fuller opportunity. That was our mistake for not making sure that uh, that, that financial document was in your packet. And Thank you. Um, we would be happy to take as long as, as the council needs to digest all that information and, and get comfortable with those concepts. Uh, I, one, one thing I did want to note, though, uh, regarding, regarding this proposed service plan amendment is that uh, there was notice of this, of this uh, proposed amendment. It, Published in the Denver Post in uh, in March, uh, so th there there was it's not <laughs> there was an effort to make sure that the public had an opportunity, and I think that's evidenced by the fact that that there were uh, some opposition letters that the council received. I did see that, but were those was that put in the paper before the the board election? To me, it's important if that was out there. Well, do you know? The, I guess when was the board election is the question. So the board election was technically, it is not technically until May, but because no candidate has come forward, uh, the, the seats have, the opportunity to run has, has passed. For, so there, that, that's, that's why I'm pausing. There, the, technically, the election would be the 2nd of May, uh, but there was, a, there was a publication and a call for nominations. It was published and made available, uh, and no property owners within the district uh, put their names in the hat to run for the election. So the, the election was deemed canceled to save the, the costs of the local government of going through that election when there's nobody on the ballot. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, if I may. I think offer. that's it. I would just say I think they're probably I get a, a good sense from the group that there is some questions about the process and we do have a, a motion that's going to be brought back with a date certain by Councillor Abel to extend this so I think this might be a op good opportunity for folks to maybe ask some other process type questions or I mean more kind of the guts of the the uh, the agreement rather than you know the process or posting type things is that amenable yes. okay thank you Councillor Harrison. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understood um, what you were talking about with the mill rate. Currently, you have a 50 mill rate. And with if this would pass, it would stay at 50 mills for a while until such time you could restructure your debt and then potentially it could drop down to whatever number it's going to be. The plan is to drop it in 2017. Okay. And that's what, when, when you look at the, uh, 
the financial plan that that is now <laughs> included in your meeting packet, uh, it you can see it it shows a drop off uh, to 45 mills in, in 2017. If so. you don't restructure the debt, how long would that 50 mil rate stay in place? Uh, I I do not know the answer to that offhand, uh, but we can have the answer that. Uh, we can have the answer to that question in advance of your next meeting. Um, that would be helpful to me. And also, um, I'm assuming that the mill rate is actually paid by the biz by the developer and then passed through in um, lease rates to the businesses that are leasing out there, correct? That's right. Okay. So the theory would be that there shouldn't be a super big increase in their lease rates with if you're – if the 50 mil rate's going to stay level, correct? Well, because what I saw, let me ask, let me ask this in a different question. We, in the letters that we received, they felt like there were a lot of businesses that were getting a pretty big increase in their, their new lease rates. And I'm concerned about that. Um, at, I want to help support small business in every way I possibly can. So, if, if that's just normal cost of doing business lease rate increase, then we'll talk. But if this is a double because of this um, mill rate, then I want to know about it. Maybe that's something I can find in your financials that I don't know yet. Point of information, Mayor? Certainly. I believe the councilwoman is under the impression that the developer holds the debt and that the income is from tenants but isn't it that the property tax from the property owners who then sublet to the renters actually the businesses um, actually I said property owner I didn't say developer so thank you but I, I thought you did say developer I, thank you yep. did I say developer okay I did mean property owner if I said developer I'm sorry thank you, thank you. So the the original developer for that project's no longer there. So there, so the property, the, there will be no increase. And on the contrary, we're anticipating a decrease in the tax rate imposed throughout that property next year. But we, we have no control over the, the leases between the current property owner and I mean, the current landlords and and their their current tenants and they're they're all sophisticated parties and they all do their due diligence and they negotiate their their lease rate um, and and they don't have a higher rate than they did last year this year and they didn't have a higher rate last year than they did the year before and they haven't had a higher rate since 2012 their rate's been the same so as property values fluctuate uh, just like with the the municipality's mill levy rate that, that can impact uh, tax liability, but but there is no request to uh, increase the rate, and we are anticipating a decrease in the rate next year. Thank you. Is that all, Karen? Yeah. Yeah. To follow up on that lease, is there an addendum in the lease agreement that lays out this potential process? So when somebody is looking to locate into that district, are they made aware that this type of process could take place? That we're dealing with we we don't have any control over the current property owners or or the current tenants so uh, there's there's not a process in place that I'm aware of where that requirement could be imposed on a landlord to provide that to a tenant uh, I can tell you when we do due diligence on behalf of tenants moving into an area with a district you, you make a public records request and and that information is all made available, uh, but that's that's the process that that typically commercial tenants go through. Council uh, President Shakti, and then uh, Council Member Franks. Uh, f f first of all, I'd like to. Um, I I don't. Um, I, I don't the the fact that more money was spent than the amount um than the five million i think um is great and i appreciate the um 
entities investing um, when they didn't know what would happen necessarily here and also that that an additional amount up to the 12 million was spent so um, I appreciate that I have a couple questions about the um, specifics here so um, help me understand how if the debt amount goes up the tax amount will go down it it's just a function of the interest rate over time it's it's similar to when a home is refinanced and you the market moves in a direction that where the assessed value increases and so you can you can uh, refinance your personal home loan and and if you've got equity in the home that has occurred as a result of of uh, assessed values increasing over time then you can you I mean I, I did this on my home you can increase the total uh, the total debt commitment over the 30-year life of the loan uh, but but get an in, uh, get a decreased uh, average interest rate over the life of the of that loan and um, thereby get get some additional debt capacity but at a lower rate okay and um, then sort of following up on um, mayor Paul's question of about the the lease source um, I understand you don't understand what the, I mean, you, you don't, aren't in a position to know about the leases. I think sort of the, the basic question is often these kinds of, um, this process happens before people are in lease agreements. And so um, I, I guess the question is how common are these kinds of amendments and are they the, and that's relevant to is it fair to expect the lease or to anticipate that there could be these kinds of amendments it, it's a great question council member the, these are industry standard when when a developer enters into an agreement with a metro district the metro district makes a commitment to uh, it, in the event that the economy goes in in the direction that that both both in both parties hope it does uh, there there are common commitments on the part of the metro district to seek approval from the 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 organizing uh, jurisdiction that whether it's a county or, or a municipality so it's it's not un, it's not uncommon on the on the contrary it's it's the the way that it's typically done and so what I understand you saying is that the amount that um, is being asked for, the changing it from five million to six million, has less to do with the actual amount that was spent, and that 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 needed to be spent to get the work done. It has more to do with the assessed property value and what debt, therefore, the district could handle reasonably. That is precisely the the difference. Thank you. Okay. So we have Councillor Franks, Vincent, Abel, Wickman. I don't. Oh, no, we don't. So we have count <laughs> Councillor Franks, Abel, Wickman. Um, another clarifying question. Just I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around the fact that a developer would spend $12 million and only theoretically, if we prove this, get $6 million back. So is that $12 million the cost of goods sold? Is it the sales price with profit built in? Or is somebody going to really eat $6 million of loss? I guess I'm trying to understand that side of the equation. It's... I mean, those there are there are pro forma assumptions that are a little different for every developer, and and I can't uh, I can't claim to you that I'm smart enough or enough of a, a numbers guy to uh, to understand their pro forma, but they do they do have an assumption of X dollars worth of of improvements that they're going to put in and and not get reimbursed for, so then they price to uh, to absorb as much of that as they can. Councilor Abel. Uh, a couple of things you have said raised even more questions. Uh, eight years ago, uh, 
10 years ago, property values seemed to be going on a spiral straight up, and then we had the recession, and we property values fell, and revenues to governments fell in many places. So an assumption, your statement about the tax decrease seems to me to be based on assumption that we all hope occurs, but may not. You, you were saying that property values would continue to increase, and as that happens, then the base would drop. Um, question about the election. Did you, uh, how well do you folks notify the property owners of upcoming elections? You, you follow all the requirements under Title 32, so you publish it in a, in a newspaper of general circulation. Uh, and then you continue to hold your meetings that are open to the public. Uh, you post for those. So those are the two ways that uh, property owners are made aware. And, and the, the point about the increase in, in uh, assessed valuations is, is a great one. Uh, and if, if there were a crash tomorrow uh, or there, the day after the, this amendment were approved uh, and, and the, day after, or the day after, let's say, bonds are issued, uh, there, there is the possibility that the mill levy would not decrease. There is no possibility that the mill levy would increase. No matter how bad market conditions are, the maximum cap mill levy out there is 50 mills. Okay, so to know the election is coming up, this gentleman over here who's a property owner would either have to peruse the legal ads in the Denver Post with regularity or come and visit the place where you post your meeting notices. Is that correct? You don't reach out. I mean, when we have an election in Lakewood, we let all of our citizens know in the best way we can, the most direct way we can. Uh, it is not that the developer would be necessarily losing money if he had to eat this million dollars. It could be he would have a million dollars less profit at the end of the day. Is that correct? Uh, I, I don't know what the developer's financial position is, so I don't if, that That is a possibility. Yeah, if we don't, if we were to say no to the million dollar increase in debt service or debt authorization, then the developer would carry that with him and it wouldn't be left behind as a burden for the district's property owners to repay. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. If, if Thank you. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. If there's something else you wanted to add, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that, that's absolutely correct. Okay. If we were to set this off for probably the shortest time we could look at would be a couple of weeks. Would that give you time to repost uh, this hearing for your folks, or would you need more time than that? Uh, I think that we would be fine, but I, I, I would it be all right if I consulted with the, I looked back at the statute, double checked, and then asked for, asked for us to push it out farther if needed. I think two two weeks would be just fine. Uh, that would be fine with me, but I think the decision is the mayor's, perhaps, or no, I mean consensus, we, or we were talking. I mean, we were talking about April twenty fifth. This would be our next regular meeting, so. We, do you need to check that? Is that something you can check right now and we can get to? Uh, we still have one more question before a motion is made with a date certain. Uh, if the council's comfortable with it, we'd, we'd be perfectly comfortable with April 25th. And then if there, if, when I look back at the statute, if there's an issue with it, we can okay. let you know. Um, that would seem to put us in a ticklish position if we schedule it for a date certain and then he finds a reason not to. Would it be more convenient, and this is just fishing around, uh, more convenient for us to postpone it for another two weeks to ensure that you would be able to meet all posting requirements and other legal notices if required? Uh, we have a May 9th would be a regular meeting. Well, we... I'm just thinking this through on the fly, and I apologize. I uh, can get a little bit of tunnel vision at times. But if we there's already been a publication, and the notice has already been provided to the public, and uh, the the meeting is being 
continued or this item is being continued in, in an open meeting. So I don't I don't see a problem with us continuing it to a date certain. It's it, it would be reflected in the minutes. Do you concur, Mr. Cox? Well, uh, Councillor, I have not reviewed the special district statute to verify the notice requirements, but it is typical under uh, our own code for uh, cases involving public hearings that when there's a notice required for the public hearing and the hearing is held and the matter continued to a date certain from then, then a, no, a new notice is not required. It uh, carries forward because this is a public meeting. So that would be typical in, in those types of cases. Before continuing with my motion, I'd yield to uh, Councillor Wickman. Thank you, sir. Councillor Wickman. A couple questions. Who is the developer? Alberta Development. Say it again. Alberta Development. Uh, how many voters are in your special district? I don't know the answer to how many potential voters there are. Every owner of real or personal property within the district is, is a potential, uh, potential elector. Are we talking about five, twelve, a hundred? Well, uh, I mean, if there's only if there's only ten property owners out there for an eleven acre project, then uh, I, I just don't know the answer. But we're it's certainly less than a hundred. Might be more on the ten. Doesn't. Okay. All right. Um, certainly could be. You said there are five seats on your board, and two of them are held by a developer. Three of them will be non-developers. Are those three seats currently filled right now? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm filling in for another attorney at our firm who does the day-to-day -day work for this project, but I can get the answer to that to you. Because I'm wondering, it, it, clearly the two developer seats are filled. Uh, if the three non-developer seats, you get a full five-person board, uh, that's one thing. Versus if the three seats are vacant and basically just the two people voted for it, a little bit different dynamic. All right, um, who voted for this? Was it the board or all the voters, which... You know, the board's five, all the voters are a dozen or so. Who voted to do this, the board or all the voters? The, the board is voting for this particular action. Uh, there was an election, a Tabor election, just like there is with the municipality, that authorized far more debt than this. So the, the lower cap in this case is the service plan cap. And when was this vote uh, taking place? You, you mentioned the election is coming up in May. Well, in order to file, the, the deadline for filing for the board was like the end of February. Uh, when was this vote, uh, as far as asking for the increase, taken before or after the deadline um, to get on the board? It, I, I will have to double check on that, but I, I, th I think it would have been before to get on your, to get on your council uh, agenda, but I, I, uh, I will have to confirm that. So hypothetically, your voters could have known about this before they had the opportunity to uh, to run for, to nominate. That's right. Okay. Um, going back to Tabor, and this is a part I'm, I'm trying to understand, why is the city involved at this point? I guess this is a special district, which is kind of an autonomous uh, government on its own. You have your own board, you have your own voters. So I'm kind of like, why are we involved in this? Because there are two different sets of parameters that limit what a special district can do. One set of parameters is their Tabor authorization. And, well, there's really three sets. There's the state statute uh, that, that uh, governs. There's a pretty large act that governs what special districts can do. Tabor governs what special districts can do. And then the service plan uh, contemplated in the, in the special district act uh, is... Uh, something that the city has or the, or the county if you're in an un, unincorporated county uh, has jurisdiction over uh, when when the service plan is first approved or anytime the service plan is amended okay so the service plan that formed this district specifically said that this would be a city council function that's right it's it's analogous to a to a municipal charter okay all right then um, finally you mentioned Tabor and again I'm trying to understand how this comes to play Ordinarily, this, by the way, these, these are bonds we're looking to, to put out, right? Right. Okay. And kind of the question other people was asking, I know you've already put out $5 million in bonds, and now we're talking about $6 million. So I guess are we talking about an additional 5 or 6 on top of that, which is your 11 or 12 that we've been talking about? Or are we talking about a whole brand new 12? And anyway, that's more detail I need to know. All right, never mind. Um, what, could, oh, you, well, but could you clarify that? that I mean, that is the, a... Sure. So the so the total aggregate uh, debt issuance being being contemplated is is about five point seven million dollars. 
So cur currently, uh, there's 3.63 million has been issued, and and what's being anticipated is is or being planned for is another uh, two million fifty five thousand. So the the district has some remaining debt capacity under its current service plan, and it, it's got about a got about a million uh, just just over, and it would like it would like to issue two million in bonds. Okay. Then a final question. I'm trying to uh, tap in Tabor. Tabor says when you do a bond, it's got to be voted on by the voters. In our case, of course, it's all the all the people. But in your case, it's the 10, 12, however number voters you have. Um, wouldn't that be the case? Has it gone to them? Yes. And all your voters, the 10 or 12 of them, all voted for this 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 new one. Because I, I know they voted for the first one, the five million year, you know, back in 2012. What about this this new one? Has the, this one been voted on? The first one authorized more than five million, because the the idea is that you don't want to have to have another. I mean, elections are relatively expensive processes, so you don't you don't want to have to go through more elections than you need to, uh, because that ultimately the cost of that election is being paid by the taxpayers within the district. So you try to you try to not have elections, Tabor elections every year if, or every two years if you don't have to. So you're saying the original Tabor election would cover this as well? That's right. And Mr. Cock concurs with that? I don't know that to be true, but I believe that, uh, that Mr. Rogers is telling us what he knows. Okay, those are my questions. Councilor Abel. Um, I'm surprised that there are 10 to 12 property owners. I thought there might be more, and a quick calculation shows me. I don't know how pricey your property is there, but each of these property owners is now in debt in addition to whatever they shelled out for the property. Now they have, if this goes through, they'll have an additional f half million to $600,000 tax burden apiece. 12 into 6 million, 500 grand a piece. So when y'all leave the district. So to make sure we're clear, there were, there were $12 million of public improvements that were built there. If, if they had been built by the city, they would be rolled into the debt service mill levy that, that the city is imposing. If they were built by the fire district or the library district or the school district they would be rolled into to those mill levies so they they are they are rolled into the district's mill levy uh, it's again there's no increase in the the rate being requested uh, so there's there's a mill levy rate that you assume uh, you, you look at i mean certainly when i'm when i'm buying a property and i would hope that a that a sophisticated uh, commercial property purchaser would, would look at the last tax bill to see that the, what the rates are of the overlapping jurisdictions. And and I would assume that those rates are going to move forward. You, you would assume that it's a, the same rate next year that it was last year, if not if not higher. Uh, so just the, again, in my mind, the, the critical fact is that there has been a 50 mil rate in place since the day the district was organized and and there will continue to be a 50 mil rate or or a lower rate if values increase and, and a lower rate can sustain the debt burden you leave out one possibility there and that's if the uh, developer didn't have a district to sh shoulder the burden of these improvements he might have had to pay them in, or the group might have had to pay them in themselves uh, okay And are there other are there other comments pending? Then I would like to uh, restate my motion that we postpone a decision to a date certain of April twenty fifth. Second, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor. One second. No, we've been uh, thinking about how this would work, and with the original motion being a motion to approve tonight. And Mr. Uh, Councilor Abel's motion to continue to a date certain, they're incompatible. So if it is the uh, will of the maker of the original motion and the seconder to withdraw the original motion, then we can, we, we can act on the motion to continue. 
if that were to fail, then there'd be a, a new motion to approve. I was actually amending that motion, I thought, but if it requires a separate motion, then I'll yield to your decision and the original maker. I withdraw my motion. Second that. I, I then, don't believe they're incompatible. You, you can't have a motion to approve tonight and then table it. Okay. So Okay, thank you. So now shall I move on with the Please. motion to uh, continue this discussion uh, for decision only or further discussion that? I'm, th I'm thinking that perhaps after all of these documents are to be reviewed by or can be reviewed by the property owners, if they want to come back and make further public comment, I would like to entertain that. So how about if we, if I move to continue the discussion and consideration of item 11 until a date certain of April 25th? I certainly would anticipate that unless the council decided it was for decision only that since you're looking for more time to review the documents that there would be an opportunity for additional discussion. So Thank you. discussion and action uh, on that date. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and uh, I I appreciate uh, coming out, Mr. Rogers. Uh, you know this is uh, some complicated stuff, so thank you for coming out and, and sharing your evening with us and trying to get us up to speed. I will be supporting this. I think it is important that we have everything that we you know everything that we needed to have on Friday in that packet. So. Ms. Hodson. Um, can I also add that we request that representatives from the district um, come on the 25th with answers to the questions that were that weren't completely answered if you'd be so kind um, so that we have those answers on the record as well thank you Absolutely. any other comments to the motion seeing none uh, please cast your votes all right and that carries uh, 11 I zero nays and uh, we will see you on the 25th and uh, in the meantime if council has questions can they reach out to you will you be available to answer any other questions that council might have absolutely happy to help answer any and I'll uh, pass my contact information on to to council to the city and uh, just wanted to say thank you all very much for your time I agree with you mayor it is a complicated topic and I I uh, appreciate your, your patience and willingness to, to uh, listen to all the answers. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. All right. Uh, item 15, executive report. Yes, just a quick reminder. Um, next week, April 18th at 530, we have a, a joint um, meeting with the Jeffco School Board. So it starts at 5.30. We'll be upstairs in the cabinet room. That'll be an introduction. And then we're going to bring the meeting down here at approximately 6.30 so that we can have that conversation televised to our viewing public. So 5.30, please, up in the cabinet room. And, of course, that's open to the public as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hodson. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I would just like to say on March the 31st, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to attend the Jefferson County um, Economic um, Awards for uh, businesses. And there were 10 awards that were given. Of those 10 awards, four of them were from Lakewood. The first three top awards were from Lakewood. And I would just like to give you a little idea of the quality of the folks that won these awards. The first one was the Pioneer Award. It was won by First Bank. And the gentleman that came up to receive this award, this is a quote from him. He said, making money is important, but it must be done in the right way. I thought, you know, I like that. The second award that's very prestigious is the Genesis Award for Economic Developer of the Year. This was by Colorado Christian University. Awesome. We can be so appreciative that they have chosen Lakewood to have their beautiful campus. The third award was the Chairman's Award, and this was won by no other than Tarumo BCT. And unbeknownst to me, they also have uh, business in um, manufacturing, I guess, in North Ireland, Belgium, Japan, 
and I think there's other other countries as well, but they chose Lakewood to have their headquarters. Yay. And then the last award that uh, was received by a business from here in Lakewood was Cater Ruma and Associates, and they are in the same industrial park as Terumo, and if I understand it right, they deal with electronic kind of um, business. It did not go a notice to me that all four of these businesses are in Ward 1. And I'm sorry, folks. I just had to throw that out. And then also, tomorrow is kind of a big deal for some one person on our council. Tomorrow is the good news breakfast, and the cat's already out of the bag, frankly. Um, this gentleman was notified last week that he's won one of these prestigious awards, and I just want everybody to know that our very own Pete Roy Ball is going to receive one of the awards at the Good News Breakfast, and um, Pete has done a lot to earn this. I'm very proud of him. That's my report. Thank you. Council President Shakti. <laughs> So it's um, volunteer appreciation season at the city of Lakewood. We have a number of um, dinners and events this time of year, and it's amazing to see all the people it takes to keep things running and the number of hours they spend and also the number of years that some people have been volunteering with the city. And then I also went to... Um, along with a number of us to um, CASA's had a breakfast court appointed special advocate and um, it was like 7 a.m. and it was totally a tearjerker and um, part of what they described was the the relationships that these advocates have with the kids and um, how important those relationships are to the kids being able to thrive so and I'm glad you mentioned that because that kind of dovetails into the proclamation we read earlier about child abuse and the CASA program. If anybody has some extra time, it's an amazing program. And they're always looking for these uh, volunteers to be advocates for these kiddos. And it looks like a real rewarding program. So, Councilor Wickman, I'll start down there. I'm trying to take a quick look here. Uh, Green Mountain High School has its capstone projects on the 14th. And uh, they're looking for community volunteers who can be a judge. Uh, coming up, we've got a number of Earth Day events. And you guys will need to chime in. I can't do them all. Uh, I believe on the 16th is the uh, electronic recycling. Uh, I think on the 20th is uh, Whole Foods. Um, when somebody else jump in and give the whole list. We'll keep going down the line. Do you have any others, sir? Um, no, that's fine. Councilor Vincent. Uh, the Ward 2 uh, meeting is 7.30 this Wednesday at 14.20 Teller. 14.80 Teller? 15. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I think you're in Home Depot, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry. At 15.60 Teller. <laughs> Councillor Royball. Councillor Harrison. Um, yes, I would like to invite everybody um, to attend the Ward 5 meeting this Saturday, 9 a.m. at the Bear Valley Church at the corner of Jewel and Lee Street. Um, we have a wonderful speaker, Travis Parker. We'll be talking about the planning process, so we're thrilled about that. And I uh, hope you can be there. Thank you. Councillor Abel. I wrote down the address. <laughs> On Saturday, Ward 1 is also having their uh, monthly meeting at Holy Shepherd Lutheran Church, 920 Kipling Street. We'll be it's from 9 to 11 a.m. We'll be discussing uh, stormwater issues, drainage issues, uh, future agenda items, and anything else that anyone has an opinion on, we'll be happy to talk about. Thank you. Councillor right, Franks. 
Thanks. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Green Mountain Area homeschoolers, two folks, James and Layla. Um, I got an opportunity to meet them. It was a, it was a joy and a pleasure to be able to meet them on their, uh, talk to them about their service project. Um, also wanted to thank the folks who came out for our Ward 4 meeting this past Saturday and uh, for all the appreciation they've given Dave and I for our outreach into the community. So thank you all very much. That's a good one. Thank you, no report. Okay. I, I would just say there's a lot of activities going on for Earth Day. Do you want to just direct them to the website? Yes, sir. I can actually, I actually found that website, so I can tell you what those are. Um, and forgive me if I'm being redundant. Um, Saturday, April 16th, um, Earth Day celebration at Liquid Heritage Center from 11 a.m. to 4. Um, April 20th, that's a Wednesday, that's Whole Foods Community Day. So whatever you spend, Whole Foods donates 5% of the day's uh, store proceeds back to the local community. That's April 20th. Um, volunteer Earth Day Project is Saturday, April 23rd from 8 a.m. till noon at Bear Creek Lake Park. And finally, we have our Sustainability Awards, and that is April 25th, which is two weeks from tonight, and that's always a really fun evening here. So if you'd like to look at what I just found, go to um, liquid.org backslash Earth Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. With that being said, I adjourn at 8.40 p.m. Thank you.